Hello and welcome back to the Uncharted Leader. I am so excited uh, for today's conversation um, for one very special reason. It speaks volumes to one of the things that I am deeply passionate about. And that is for those who are uh, two, two categories of people. Number one, you're an executive in an organization with a ton of experience and you are frustrated and you are looking for something more fulfilling and rewarding in your life, but you are too scared to leave because your pay packet is too damn good. And so you're a little bit scared, but you'd love to exit and you're not sure what to do. Now, if those who, of you who have been and listening to my podcast for some time, you'll know that that was my experience back in 2015 when I finally left my career at News Corp. Um, but the second category is then entrepreneurs. You know, those of you who have made the leap or have been out there for some time, it is tough. It's not an easy thing to do to run your own business, start up a business, scale a business, survive in business. It's tough. Now, that's kind of what we're going to be in here talking about today. But specifically, why would I want to talk about that now, given we are right in the middle of what is supposedly being talked about as in a, an impending 2023 recession? Well, let me tell you this. My guest today is um, the founder of a company called Scalefest, which works with thousands of entrepreneurs every year in helping them be successful. But the thing that makes this gentleman outstanding is his journey into this business himself. Not only was it organic and his desire to help people solve a problem, but during the middle of a recession, did the same thing. A so-called recession and, and had to was confronted with building a business himself and has gone out and has helped thousands of people be successful. So I really want to welcome my guest today, um, Mike Bourne Plenner, and I hope to goodness I have had the pronunciation right, <laughs> um, who is the founder of Scalefest. And, you know, I think what we, one of the things we're going to get in today is, you know, it's very easy to categorize people into either, you know, you're an executive or you're an entrepreneur, but, you know, let's forget that because quite frankly, you know, you've got, you might be an executive with an entrepreneurial spirit, but what we need to do more of, which is what Mike's up to is bringing these people together, you know, to have a meeting place where people can really you know, unite, work on a new future where we can see personally, and this is the passion and shared vision that both Mike and I have, is it for a future where a greater proportion of the population are entrepreneurs and business owners and don't feel like the only option they have is to go work for somebody else. So Mike, thank you so much for joining me today. I am so looking forward to today's conversation. I really want to thank you um, for being here and sharing some of your story and sharing what you're passionate about. Thank you. Well, thanks for putting me on your show at relatively short notice. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today. And, uh, you know, I'm sort of uh, anxious about what we're going to be talking about because we haven't scripted anything here. At the same time, I'm excited about, you know, the next half an hour or whatever it's going to be and, you know, chatting with you. So, yeah, let's, let's get into it. Well, let's start with this. Let's say it's a bad idea. So I remember. <laughs> so I, I, I remember being in a leadership program back in 2020, 2012, actually, and it was a year long program, right? And at the end of the first quarter, each quarter it was like running quarters, and you'd run a game plan over each quarter, and you'd kind of develop yourself as a leader. And but each quarter, people within the in the in the um, group would get allocated roles as leaders. And, um, you know, at the end of the first quarter, what you would do is you'd sit down and then everyone would nominate who they want to be the leader in the next quarter, right? So here I am at the end of in that, in that session and I got nominated to be the leader for the next quarter. And I'm like, oh, seriously? So, I, you know, so I'm standing at the front of the room, right? Not knowing really what, how did this all happen? So for a position I didn't at the time really want for myself, right? I was like, no, I want to sit back for once. You know, I've been in leadership for years. And I'm like, no, I want to sit back. And so I'm standing there and the trainer from the back of the room calls out, you know, being a leader is a bad idea, right? And honestly, I thought, is she kidding? I'm like in this program because lead, to me, being a leader is a bloody great idea. But anyway, as quick as I had that thought, I lied. I turned around. I said, yeah, of course I do, right? 
But see, the thing that struck me, we're having a conversation about entrepreneurship, right? In a time where you'd go, that's a really dumb idea. You could go, it's a dumb idea, but you have been somebody who has built and supported entrepreneurs for for decades, right? Mm. And I want to bring this up. Why would we have this conversation when technically people could go, there's too much at risk. You know, there's too much uncertainty. It's too hard. What do you think about that? Well, it depends on what you value. If your highest value is freedom, then, well, a little bit of risk is a small price to pay for controlling your own destiny, controlling your own fate. It really boils down to that. If your highest value is a life where you just every day walk in, you do what you're told and, you know, and you do good work, but, you know, you may not feel that you have that kind of level of meaning, then, hey, there's a lot of options available. And I think it's important to address the risk question. Uh, Meta laid off 11,000 people last couple of days, as far as I recall. Uh, you're probably following the news more than I do. But, um, you know, it's like, oh, well, I thought that was a pretty safe company. And, you know, it seems like they have lots of money. So why would they possibly think of laying off people? We're going to think about the reality is that when you are a very large organization, the levers that you're going to pull in times of, of, of setback and times of downturn are much heavier and much bigger. And so, you know, if, if you look at the, the sort of where the whole business landscape is going, corporate versus professionals versus entrepreneurship or business ownership, there are a number of trends. And I'm, I mean, I'm not the guy writing the trends. I'm just the guys sitting there reading them and going, okay, if I had that trend and that trend and that trend together, well, this, this is really, really interesting. And what I see in that is that we are already inside a decade where there's going to be massive growth or what you may call, using old-fashioned language, the entrepreneurial class. And there's going to be a shrinkage of the professional class and there's going to be a shrinkage of the corporate class. does not mean either one of them are going to go away, but it just means proportionately it's going to start shifting. It's going to shift very, very significantly in this decade. It's not something that's happened when our grandkids are growing up and whatever. Not no, no. This is this is right now, right here. Yeah. Look, you, I think you bring up a really great point um, that you know, whilst we might be in a, a job, that certainty about the job is an illusion. There is there is no certainty these days. Like you say, eleven thousand people out of matter. I mean, I, that was certainly an unpredictable outcome I'm pretty sure for those people you know and I'm even now you know companies are going through a lot of restructuring constant restructuring to deal with the economic uncertainty and so thinking that we're certain or fixed or safe in a job is really an illusion that has no no guarantee Um, I want to jump to your experience um, and some of the journey that you've had um, as a business owner and entrepreneur yourself I know you talked about how when you first came to Australia because you're from Denmark um, that you started a, a, your own business, which you, I think you even said that you could argue it was a dumb idea at the time because it was in the middle of a recession. So what had you what had you start the business? And can you tell us a little bit about your journey at that point? Sure. I mean, I had a great corporate career in Europe and it was a bit like I reached my 10 plus years goal in three. And so I got to the, uh uh-oh, now what? I hadn't really thought about, well, when you achieve that level of executive and my my next posting would have been either become the CEO of a smaller software company at the the right ball age of 28 uh, or become international leader within the the organization I was in. I was already having an international leader position, but I had to move to another country if I wanted to move higher up the ladder. I was like, hmm. Not really sure I'm that keen on that much admin. Not really sure I'm keen on this hiring and firing employees that I've already done a lot of in a couple of years with that company. And I thought maybe there's another way. And somehow I thought Australia was a good idea. And you know, long story short, I'm now here. And you know, as a as an employee, I was missing a transfer. That was pretty much a done deal. Except when I arrived here, 
you know, the CEO that I walked into his office, oh, I'm really sorry, but a few things have changed. And just the thing that we thought this was going to happen, well, the, this guy's role that you're going to take over is still here. And oh, it's probably just going to be a couple of months. I mean, time we figure something out, I was like, I'm smelling a rat here. I'm not liking this. <clears throat> so I walked out and I started a business. And uh, yeah, dumb idea, very dumb idea to start a business in, in the recession we had to have. Um, but the reality was that, well, it was a better idea than trying to find a job when there were no jobs available. And I was a, the, the latest newcomer off the boat, so to speak, to use old language, right? Um, just, there was, there was, that was not going to happen. So at least being in business, I did have some degree of control over my own destiny. And it didn't go too badly. So I'm still here. <laughs> well, well done. It's still being here. Um, I, I, do, I do want to ask you, though, um, you know, I, do, I, I can see that there are definitely extra challenges that you would have had at the time because not being a local number one, it, when, when you start up a business, you'd like to think that you know a lot of people so that you could easily make that transition. I also acknowledge that, you know, coming out here, you weren't already in an organisation here locally. So I know a lot of people, and certainly my biggest regret is one of the decisions I thought when I left News Corp was that I should have started something before I exited. So I actually made, <laughs> walked out with existing clients, didn't do that, right? But so I'm already I'm hearing two particular challenges that would have made it more difficult for you to do that. So what did you do that got you, how did that unfold for you to start to build the business? Well, it unfolded well. I mean, I realized I had, I mean, I already knew software. I worked in a couple of software businesses. Um, and I realized, well, like there was a need for some software that I had with me from Europe. And, you know, long story short, we started selling and, you know, it worked. Um, but it, it, it's like, was that a challenge? Yes, but it was an overcomable challenge kind of thing. It was not an insurmountable challenge. It was like, oh, well, it's going to be a bit of hard work. Let's get on to it kind of thing. And um, that's carried on. Mm. And now here you are running a yes. business. That's a, few, a, few, a few battle scars later, yes. A few battle scars. Well, I'm all, I'm, I love battle scars. <laughs> Yes, I mean, you, you, you wouldn't be an entrepreneur if you didn't have battle scars as far as I That's can tell. True. But, but here you are now running a business, um, Scalefest, can you, which is supporting, and I, I know you, you know, you have host events, but you've got programs that help business owners and entrepreneurs go from things like scaling and, and building, but um, to, and to be funded. Uh, so Clearly, over those years, you've learned a lot of lessons that's allowed you to, you know, get to this place. Why don't, why don't you give us a little bit of an insight in, in, into Scalefest and what you're now doing? So Scalefest is a big event. It's a big global event. It runs for 24 hours. It covers four big cities, Sydney, Singapore, London, and New York City. Scalefest is built on a fundamentally different premise as to most events. It just does not just, hey, I came... It was a nice event. I met some lovely people. Oh, I really enjoyed that speaker. And then you go home and you do nothing. Because I assure you, the people that do that do really pisses me off. Because you speak to people two weeks later and say, I know you had trouble with marketing. I know you went to that event there and it was the top marketing speaker. So how much of that have you implemented in your business? And they go, well, nothing. I'm like going, what? I'm like, excuse me? Like, what? And so Scalefest is built very differently. It's really built for the entrepreneur to come there and get that inspiration, see some people they aspire to move into a state of transformation. In other words, take that cool stuff and go, on, well, take my laptop or iPad or whatever, whatever the tool is or pen and paper and start applying that into the business that they're working on and the business that they're working in. And then the third step of that is get some help. Like, so, okay, you might know that you need some polishing, like improvement on, say, the marketing front. And so you hear a couple of speakers that talk about marketing and you do a couple of workshops and say, okay, how can I do better marketing in my business? But you probably also need to hire either an agency or maybe a social media manager or on part-time or a PR company or depending on whatever it is that you require. And so, therefore, there's an important part of this that is the integration of these partner companies. That's not what we do. 
So, so we are looking for companies that, you know, are these professional services, do this kind of software, all this kind of stuff, because it's not a, oh yeah, by the way, there's a couple of people over there have an expert booth. No, no, it's integrated into it because my big vision for Skillfest is it's not just a one day event and people come and they clap and they're happy and they go, oh, that was a really great event and they give us five stars. Well, that's lovely. That's nice. But it doesn't bloody change the world. What does is if they actually go and do something meaningful, what, what they learned, what they saw with who they met for the next 364 days. So when they come back for Scale Fest a year later, they go, well, in the last year, I've grown my business by 10% or 100%, whatever. It's not about a particular number is better than another number. If you're running a $100 million a year business, growing 10% is pretty respectable if you're running a one million dollar business growing 100 is very respectable and it really moves the needle right it's a little bit easier i mean getting 400 to 200 million dollars in most businesses is hard let's put it that way in one year so it's not about that they are particular you have to do this within x time frame there is something that is relevant to your business your journey where you're up to on that journey now we want to support for the next 364 days along with a bunch of partners that come along for that journey, whether that's the accountant or the brand marketing expert or the SaaS software provider or whatever else they need, you know, you know, the startup and scale up world as I do. And, and there's an awful lot of things that needs to be around a good business to make the good business a great business. Well, I love, I, I'm reminded of um, a couple of things. Firstly, I love the way you go, well, that's really nice to come to an event and you feel really good, but what's the point? Because it's actually not going to do anything. Like, great, so great, because there are far too many events in the market that come for just such a great feel good, but people don't then get the tangible benefit back, back into their lives, right? And there's a couple of things, obviously, that you've rightly pointed out about that. It's not so much that there's necessarily the desire for people who are hosting those events to have the impact, but it does take something as an individual when you go to participate in something, you got to do something about it. So mm. With that said, it reminds me a lot of even internally in, in corporations, right? Leadership, $366 billion a year is spent on leadership development. And do you know that there is supposedly a 2% uplift in the value return on investment for that? That Ooh. is shocking. Now, you kind of go, well, how's that so? Well, how many times have you, I mean, and, and you may have experienced this back in your own days, um, is when you go into a company and there's all these learning and training and developments, you go and you sit in and, oh, it's really inspiring, you know, really motivating. And then you go back to your desk and you shovel your notes back and you draw and you go, well, what difference did that make? So the thing I really love about what you've said, Mike, is the, is the, comp, the, the transformation. So the, the actual follow-up, but it requires two things. One is as an individual being there, there's the transformation and work to be done to have the impact. But secondly, you're obviously creating programs and resources and whatever that is to make that possible for people so that they're not on their own. Mm. And I think that, that, if anything, and I, I, this might actually segue to something that you brought up before about um, one of the things that you want to, that you're committed to is being able to create these, the scale fest as a place where there's the meeting of minds, you know, there's mm. the meeting of the entrepreneur with the meeting of the executive. Can you shed some light for us on what, what does that actually look like in reality? Well, you know, if, if we look at the, the outcome first and then we revert back to, well, how does that journey get started? The outcome for many successful pairings of executives and business owners or entrepreneurs look something along the lines of it's you know, a couple of hours a week up to maybe five or 10 hours a week, depending on whatever the relationship is, but it's really for the entrepreneur to have someone on their side that is their, their, their trusted advisor that is probably have been there, done that, that have resources and connections that the entrepreneur may otherwise not have. Then is also for the advisor or the executive to look the other way and going, oh, well, I can really add some value, but also learn a lot. It's about, oh, so this is how we do it in a young business with no budget and bright hopes, but not much revenue, et cetera, et cetera. 
And so in some situations, these kind of interactions are paid. Sometimes it's how you get some shares. Sometimes you do it for the goodness of your heart. Well, that's obviously up to the individual how they want to do it. I'm not going to meddle in that. But the reality is that there is an enormous amount of knowledge exchange that contrary to a lot of people think can be done very effectively in, in a very short period of time. It's not something that needs hundreds and hundreds of hours to actually have impact. You can do a lot with a little. And I would encourage people that are thinking about that is like, you know, I think in most large organizations, it would be welcome. Hey, you want to go on, do some mentoring or coaching or whatever that hold or sit on a advisory board. Yeah, go for your life. Gain some experience because you actually bring stuff back into the large organization that says, hey, I saw this thing over here. We could do what they do. I'm sure we'll need to modify, but that's actually a really cool way of doing it. And so there's a number of opportunities in the in the lounges at Scalefest, the virtual lounges, and, and for that matter, the physical um, kind of get togethers as well, where people can meet and and start having these conversations, exchange their details and go, well, that's really interesting. Let's take that online, offline, whichever line it's supposed to be on, um, and, and take that step further. And so it's not a, a crazy thing. Then there's, there's and we, we're sort of setting up a number of ways in which people can say, well, I'm looking for, or I can offer. So it's more clear how the pairings can work. That's still up to a bit of luck or chance, if you will. You know, I can't guarantee that, that every pairing will be just what we always look for. It's not, this is not Cinderella. Um, but it is um, a way of actually building genuine connections with people across a shared vision around building better businesses. Because at the, at the end of the day, Scalefest is here because there is scope for and there is a need for building better businesses that have a lower failure rate and that have more joy and happiness in them. I love it. I love it. I love it. I, I'm, you know, as as a old school executive, I would have to say, what a fabulous opportunity. You know, when I left, um, you know, when I first was challenged with not being able to work full time anymore in executive position, and I, what what frustrated me the most was I would, as you know, after twenty years of climbing the corporate ladder, you're at a stage in your career where you're there to give back. You know, you, you, you've gone through the hard yards, you know, you're leading a team because you're mentoring other people <laughs> and imparting advice, right? So I, I noticed just as you were sharing of that, that, what a great solution, um, I think, on, on, on many fronts for those who are in, in executive positions. I know a lot of executives are really bored. I know that sounds really insane to say, but some are really bored. Um, and, and this sounds like just a magnificent opportunity for those that, you know, don't even need to consider whether they're going to exit their job, but to come and be part of a community where they can impart some of their wisdom and their experience and, you know, connect with entrepreneurs who are up for stuff. I mean, immediately I'm, I'm present to this, what, what a blinding spot of inspiration and passion for people who may have been, you know, in jobs for 20, 30, 40 years and, hmm. uh, you know, a, a kind of looking for a little bit of passion, you know? And maybe... For some, this will be the way out or the way on to their 2.0. And for others, yes. they'll be, hey, this is fantastic. How about to keep that as a sideline? Maybe they start, you know, working with one business. Maybe they grow that to a portfolio. Maybe they invest. Maybe they don't want to invest. You know, there, there's so many avenues and so many tweaks you can do on this, depending on what the heart's desires are. And I think that's important to, I guess, recognize that it's not a it's not a one size fits all, first of all, but also <clears throat> in order to be effectively going into, say, a situation uh, as an executive working with with a young business, you really need to be clear on okay, what can I offer? You know, what am I good at? Maybe I'm really suck at marketing, but I'm really great at doing the numbers, or maybe it's the other way around. But also, what's my boundaries? You know, I, I, you know, if you want to take a meeting at 11 a.m. on a Monday, that's just not possible because I have a full-time job. That's just, that's not cool. But if you want to speak to me at 8 p.m., that's perfectly fine. That's my time. I can do whatever you want, right? And so those kind of things are really important. 
from a personal management perspective. And I've, I've certainly seen many people that have transitioned into, hey, actually I could do this. And, and also I think it's worth mentioning that, you know, a lot of, a, a lot of executives have a, what I call a business in the belly. And they're working on it in the attic or in the garage or whatever it might be. And, and they do that for years. But there's a failure to take the jump and going, okay, I'm just going to skip, quit my job. I'm just going to take the, the big step into the abyss. This is the way to get a sense of, well, what does the abyss look like? This is like an exploratory mission. Oh, it's actually not so bad down here. Actually, I can fly. Hmm, that's not too bad. I should try that more often. This is kind of fun. Right. And it's like, but until you grow on your wings, you just don't really know where you're just going to crash to the ground or whether this is actually going to work. So it's it's a way, because I see so many of these businesses that are stuck and, I, you know, you meet them at meetings and they come to yeah, our events and they come and talk to me, I come to talk to my colleagues and say, hey, I've been working on this. Thing. Oh, yeah, but how long? Hey, I've been working on this for four years. Why haven't you launched it? Oh, yeah, but and what if it doesn't work? I'm like, yeah, well, you never know, will you? Do you want to die not knowing or do you just want to get on with it? And so Skillfist to a significant extent is also for those people that have that business in their belly. And yes, fully recognizing that they're, they're not there, they're not ready to scale, they haven't even launched it yet, but forearmed is forewarned. So it's a bit like you go to an event like Skillfest, you find out, ah, these are all the tools that I need. Ah, this is the kind of capital I need to raise. Ooh, I better go back and rewrite my business plan before I get into this kind of murky territory. And no, suddenly now it's no longer jumping off the cliff. So now it's actually like, well, I'm just executing a plan. It's what I do for a day job, executing a plan. It's what all of us do in a, when you have a job, right? And so you can use that as your secret weapon to basically uh, build a better business that will survive when you put it out there to see. Mm. Foundation sounds like solid foundations. Yep. Like building a house, making sure you put the concrete in before you put the p p pillars up. <laughs> and put your foot the roof before you put the roof on. Yeah, it doesn't. It looks weird when you sort of put a couple of toilets and a sink in the middle of the field, right? And there's just nothing underneath them. Yes. Doesn't quite work, does it? No. That's right. That's right. Look, the, the, I think the other, of course, the other side of the coin here um, is I, I hear a lot about the benefit that you're providing for entrepreneurs themselves. Um, you know, I think I'd, I'd have to confess to being very ignorant, um, having spent 23 years of being an employee. And then, you know, thanks to my, I'll dob my mate in on this one. Here you go. I won't take responsibility for this part. <laughs> Saying to me, it's time you left, you know, you need to get out of here and fulfill on your potential, you know, and of course, I, as I walked away from having lunch with him, I, you know, kind of did the internal up, up yours kind of thing, like, who do you think you are saying that to me, right? <laughs> but it was one of those moments where as soon as I did that, I kind of went, yeah, I think it's right. I think, you know, uh, anyway, a year later, I, 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 I exited and, you know, it was an organic decision at the same time. I just found myself, you know, very moved and passionate about something. So, but, but, oh my God, how ignorant I was to what it takes, you know, and I think the biggest challenge I found is coming out of being an executive, you take for granted it actually how easy it is. You know, you've got sales teams, you've got tech team, you have a HR team, you have a finance manager, you have a HR business partner. I mean, you are, it's an environment full of teams. Now, I, what I realized was actually how great I am at stakeholder management and building great teams, right? But what I realized is as an entrepreneur and you're out, you're like looking around and you're like, where's the team? You know, oh shit, you mean I need to do this? I certainly got to work out how to do that. And I got to work out how to do this. And you know, that world is incredibly, um, can definitely screw up your mindset, right? But I, I'm hearing that this is one of those things that you're, you know, if I put the entrepreneur's hat on and sitting in your scale fest events, that what you're doing is you're giving these people access to people or and or conversations that are helping solve that problem. Yes. And there's, two elements of an event like this, and it's probably worth dwelling on this in the context of what you just said. So there is, in order to be 
successful, and this is obviously a hyper oversimplification, but you need some frameworks. You need some theories, you need some management structures, you need a marketing plan, you need to have all of these kind of structural things. And so in a place like Scalefish, we cover that with, you know, the guy that wrote the book, the lady that built the model, the, you know, all of those kind of things that is, if you will, the fundamental infrastructure pieces. That is, this is how we just done. You know, I spent 20 years at Harvard. I researched this to the bottom of the box. This is the ultimate way of building X. Okay, so that's one side. The other side is what I refer to as the lived experience. The lived experience is I started a business. It failed. It crashed. I started another business. It failed. It crashed. I started a third business and I'm a billionaire. How did I do that? Or I started one business that went all right. It came to six figures. I started the next business. Tim did a bit better. Came to seven figures. I started a third business. We're now at eight figures and counting. Right. You know, how did I do that? What was the experience? What were the setbacks? How did I recover from that? And what ties this together, like the ribbon on the box, is mindset. You know, in corporate speak, we often talk about a word called resilience. Mm. You just speak to an entrepreneur about resilience and look at you going, what are you talking about? What do you mean? The, what? <laughs> because it's built in. Because oh, okay. you, if you didn't have resilience, you wouldn't, you would just have gone yeah. under. Yeah. Right. And, and so resilience is just one component of mindset because it's actually more than just mindset is maintaining a healthy mental state. Because if you maintain a mental healthy state and part of that is actually maintaining a healthy body state, um, but, and some people will probably disagree with this, but your mental state drives your body state, not the other, well, like and, and sort of a little bit the other way around, but they, they kind of interact, they kind of play with each other, right? And, you know, we all have different ways of dealing with our mental state. But, you know, setbacks are given. Setbacks are part of the, this is what you, it's like, do you eat porridge for breakfast? Yes, every day. Okay, well, do you have setbacks every day? Yes, I do. Well, it's just, it's just, it just happens. Mm. The, the, what sets apart the great entrepreneurs from the, well, not so lucky entrepreneurs is not that you have fewer setbacks or more setbacks. No, but how do you deal with them? How quickly do you deal with them? Does the setback take you a week because you spend five days crying? Or does it take you an hour because you just need to go to a dark place or go around the block for another cup of coffee or whatever it is, or just go and stare at the sun for three minutes? We all have different coping mechanisms. It doesn't matter what they are. Well, what matters is you stick to them and you keep evolving your coping mechanism because if you can shrink your, I need a week to get over this, to a day to get over this, to an hour to get over this, well, it doesn't take a genius to figure out when you're over this, an hour to get over a major setback, you develop business at a speed of like lightning speed. Whereas in the earlier phases where you may not have quite developed that muscle, and it's a muscle that everybody has. It's not like something that you're born with. No, but it's something that most people fail to train. Just like many of us fail to go enough, often enough to the gym or to some other kind of exercise. Because, oh yeah, but I'm busy writing email. Oh, I'll, I'll deal with the weightlifting later on, right? And, you know, I see, you know, and, and it's like, this is where this is why I should say that people that have spent a couple of decades in a corporate life, generally speaking, a very successful entrepreneurial life because they have, generally speaking, like if they're successful, not if they've just been going around at the same level for 20 years, is what they have is discipline. Discipline is strange enough the mother of pretty much all invention, right? Because discipline is what gets you to get up at 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m., whatever the chosen time is. And it's not like 4 is necessarily better than 5, but it's the fact that every morning it's 5.02 or 5.10 or whatever the time is. That's discipline. It's that, it, you know, four times a week on Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays, I do this kind of exercise. It is, you know, at least twice a week I eat with my family. That's discipline. It's not 
is not obligation, it's discipline. It's like, you know, and a lot of people that are successful in corporate life became successful because they had discipline. And that is an exceptionally transferable skill into the entrepreneurship. And if I take all the other things away, it's the one thing that I observe all the time as to what makes great corporate executives become great you know, business owners and executives in their own business is because they have that mindset of you know, working through discipline. It's not because they're smarter in marketing. It's not necessarily because they had a bigger Rolodex, but that does help. Um, I don't know why we still call it a Rolodex. We haven't had a Rolodex for 40 years, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> but it's like, you know what I'm saying? It's just yeah. like that discipline thing really, really does shine out. And it's like, and we work with it very intensively. And for that reason, also, we got several speakers at Scalefest that are talking about the mindset. It's not just how to make more money. It's not just how to hire more people and build a big organization. No, it is you. How do we maintain you? Because if you start flaking out for whatever reason, as a leader, we have a problem, all of us. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, there's a couple of things I want to ask you about before we wrap up. But the, the first, the thing we I want to come back to is, um, you know, from your point of view, you know, I like to end the interview with your view on what a great leader looks like, but I'll, I'll come back to that to complete. The one thing I want to ask you before I do that is you have a view on what you think are the three things that an entrepreneur needs. Can you share with us what you think those three things are? In order to be successful, and this, this is hard to reduce it down to just three things, um, but in order to be successful, you, you've got to have, you know, you're going to have a way with people because it does require leadership. There is no way, well, should never say that it's really hard to build a great business without any people in it. So leadership does come as the first thing because leadership is also what you would call managing through other people. You know, you might hire somebody that is say a marketing agency, and maybe you're speaking to the principal of the marketing agency, but the reality is, you know, somebody else is doing the work. Well, you need to speak through that principal to reach the people that are doing the work. And you need to learn that. So again, leadership is, is a really important thing. The other thing that is really important is you need to have a sense of how to bring something to market commercially. We live in a world now where from a product perspective, almost everything, not everything, but a lot of things, a really huge lot of things have been completely commoditized. You know, yes, the traditional foodstuffs and whatever don't be commoditized for decades, but the reality is software development is commoditized. If you and I have a great idea to some new software platform, we can put a couple of hundred K into a software team in, you know, a third world country or whatever, and we will have a pretty decent thing that at least we can take to the, to the market and start selling. So therefore, you know, the, the ability to commercialize this has now become more important than the ability to develop some outstanding product that no one's ever heard about. Right. Because there are more businesses out there that are more successful by basically bringing to market something that is actually not that much of a novelty and it's not that much you know improvement from an IP perspective, intellectual property, but they just have a better mousetrap. So we see the businesses that are winning are those with a better business model, with a better go-to-market strategy. They basically execute on that. Mm -hmm. And the third thing that people are going to have, and, and I'm going to put a fourth one in just for the sake of the bonus, but the, the thing that is, and this is, goes back to what a lot of people say, but they kind of mistake kind of how it actually works, but you need to have enough capital to execute on all the things we just talked about. Mm. Now, a lot of people equate that to me, you know, we got to go and raise capital. Well, that's not what you have to do, but you've got to have enough. You've got to have the foundations of capital with it. That comes because the entrepreneur, uh, you know, slaughters a mortgage or hits the bank of mom and dad or 
does something else or pre-sells a product or there's so many ways in which you can create a capital foundation for a business without going to raise capital in the formal sense of the word. But capital is important and the management of that capital is very, very important because if you don't do that properly, it will look like you're running out of capital, you're running out of money. The reality is, that, and that's a perception, it's not that the reality is actually not that you ran out of anything except time. So we're all overly optimistic on how quickly things will go and it tends to be that everything takes twice as long, at least, right? And it's just, just the reality of it. So the bonus, the fourth thing is that you got to have systems because when you have a very young business, yes, you can make do with bits of revenue, have a bunch of people, and so on and so forth. I have enough money to, to kind of produce your goods and get them into the market. If you want to scale that business, you cannot do that without proper systems, systems, processes, structures, procedures, all of this kind of stuff. And when we say systems is anything from logistics to CRM to your accounting software to blah, 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 blah. But it's also all the processes. It's your job descriptions. It's your marketing plan. It's uh, all of those other things. They're systems too. Because they they are what tells everybody this is what you need to do. Like it's the classic in case of fire break glass, right? Everyone knows what that looks like and what that means and what happens when you do that. Alarm bells start sounding. But the reality is that there's a system behind that. There's some cabling and some wiring and there's a bell somewhere else. If it wasn't for that, that little red box with a glass in it wouldn't do anything. And so a lot of people forget the systems that are behind the scenes and therefore when they start scaling then the proverbial wheels fall off the truck simply because they just go into the team and going go faster go faster sell more sell more and the team goes boss i'm already doing 12 hours a day and i'm doing emails on sundays it's like how much faster can i go before i start falling over right and you get disgruntled employees and resentment and whatever not and the reality is that you can't go that much faster unless you have proper systems in place. Now, the negative side of systems is you cannot afford to build all those systems before you start. Mm. So you're going to build them along the way. It's the classic. This is why there's this saying about, you know, jump off the cliffs and you build a parachute on the way down. <laughs> right. And which is very true. So the, the metaphor that refers to is actually building systems. Right. Because if you and I were starting that new business and we're going to build all our accounting systems, our ordering processes, write all the JDs and whatever, years pass. We still haven't done a single cent in revenue. That's stupid. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to just do that equally. So back into what we're doing with Skillfest, we're covering those four pillars simply because they in different measures at different times, but they're all essential. Like I can't take one of them away and still think I'm running a successful business. It's just not possible. But again, back to where we started, it starts with people, it starts with leadership, which is why I'm here with you. Yeah, great. Well, perfect segue to complete the interview uh, today and the conversation. So I've got a statement and uh, I'd like you to complete the statement for me. Uh -oh. um, <laughs> a leader is someone who... A leader is someone that that just goes in there with the gum boots on and shows the way. A leader is someone that, you know, sets clear expectations, but also expects, you know, that everybody pulls their weight. And I think the challenge for a lot of leaders, true leaders, is to distinguish between leadership and management. Some people kind of get them awfully mixed up. And it's a bit like you do need both. You can't just be a great leader and have no management whatsoever. And you can't just be a manager and have no leadership skills, right? It, it's like, so to me, the modern leader is in there going the way, building the systems, documenting the way, keeping everyone not motivated because I don't quite believe in motivating people, but inspired and paving the way and going, hey, this is the way we're all going. And I see that the effective leader is one that leads from a values and beliefs perspective that starts with 
this is what I believe in, this is what I stand for, therefore I build a business that is exposing or espousing, sorry, those values. And so if you as an employee have completely different worldview, well, maybe it's just not really gonna work out. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a lion worldview and like, oh wait, we we're really on the same path, well, light, like work becomes very light. Work actually is no longer work. Work is like, how was your day? Well, it was amazing. And we did all this stuff. And it's like the boss reached my mind. I can't believe it. It's like, it's like so easy. And like, well, because alignment of beliefs and values. Yeah. yeah. It's really great. It's been such a wonderful conversation. I, I mean, so much um, value out of today's conversation, talking about values. And uh, I, I think, you know, firstly, what we will do is make sure that we put some links inside the show notes for people to check out your events at Scale Fest and make sure Thank that... You. Um, sounds like a really extraordinary thing to be a part of and, and and the work that you're doing you know I think you know obviously given my passion for the same kind of field about getting more people you know into their entrepreneurship is just outstanding so thank you so much again for joining me today it's been a wonderful conversation well thank you for having me this has been a lot of fun so um, have a great rest of the day and look forward to seeing you again soon thank you